This is Easter in 60 seconds. Easter really has nothing to do with eggs and bunnies, but everything to do with a cross and a tomb. The Son of God was born as a man, Jesus, lived a perfect life. Every human, including you and I, have sinned, but Jesus never sinned. Despite this, the officials of his day put him on trial and sentenced him to death on a cross. That was Good Friday. Good because while we're the ones who deserve to die for our sins, Jesus took our place. He was punished with death so that we could be pardoned with life. Jesus' body was sealed in a tomb that day, but two days later, when Easter Sunday rolled around, the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. Jesus conquered death itself and rose again to life, appearing to many witnesses before ascending to heaven to reign forever. He died and rose again so that we can live forever with him. That's good news. That's the story of Easter. Uh, well, several years ago, I went into my backyard in Waco to do some yard work, and there was a possum laying on the ground, lifeless. And I know what you're thinking, he's probably playing possum. And uh, I wanted to make sure that that was the case, and so I just stood there and watched this guy for a significant amount of time to make sure that he was, in fact, dead, because if he was dead, I was going to relocate him to a better place. Uh, specifically my trash can. And so I stood there and I watched this guy and I actually moved in close and got up close to where I could look to see if there was even the faintest sign of just like a <sighs> nothing, nothing, completely lifeless. So after a period of time, I called it. I was like, 925. And then I went around the corner to get my relocation tools, which was a broom and a dustpan. And when I turned back around, that possum was running along my fence line. And when I saw that, when I saw him doing that, I kid you not, here's what I did. I went. <laughs> and I assumed a fighting position. Because if that guy just beat death, no telling what else he wants to beat. And when I think back about that possum, I think that there's only really two explanations for what was happening that day. The first option is that he beat death. Like he was dead and then he was alive. And I got to witness it. That's the first option. The second option is that he was alive but just looked dead. And then something changed that caused his activity to better reflect his reality. Do you see where I'm going this morning? Are you offended yet that I'm comparing you to a possum? <laughs> see, this morning we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's the good news. The good news is that every single one of us is going to die someday. And the reason that that is good news is because the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us hope that one day we will beat death. Even though we die, we are going to live, all because Jesus Christ has risen and conquered the grave. Because he conquered death, so shall we. But then another reality that we just need to process through this morning as we talk about the resurrection is the fact that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there's a good possibility that you are spiritually alive and yet there are different areas of your life where you still look dead. And what we need to get our minds around this morning is the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us the power for change so that our activity can better reflect our reality, that we are in fact alive in Christ. And so what I wanna to do today is I wanna take you to my favorite story in the entire Bible. It's John chapter 11. And as we turn to John chapter 11, there's really two truths that are gonna become clear to us. And the two truths are this. Number one, Jesus is our hope for life one day. But not just that, Jesus is our power for life today. So if you want hope, the hope that you will one day when you die, you will still live, that you will beat death, that hope is found in Jesus. And if you wanna experience the power 
to change today. That you would not just be spiritually alive, but that you would look alive. Then that power is only found in Jesus Christ. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, this story is the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. It's been my favorite story in the Bible for years now. Before we jump into the text, let me just catch you up on what has been happening. There's three people who are siblings, Mary, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And the text is really clear that Jesus loves all three of them. Lazarus gets sick, so sick to the point that Mary and Martha send word to Jesus and say, hey, you better come, it's not good. And instead of Jesus going to Lazarus, he does nothing. He does absolutely nothing. And Lazarus ends up dying. Jesus knows that Lazarus is dead because he's God and knows all things. And finally, after Lazarus has died, Jesus did what Mary and Martha thought he should have done from the beginning. He actually goes to where they are. And on the way to Bethany, where they are, Jesus is met by Martha, and they have this very defining conversation. And in this conversation, Jesus is going to make a massive declaration about himself, and then he's going to invite Martha to really decide what she believes to be true about him. So let's look at what happens. Verse 17 says this, now... When Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So let me just give a little side point real quick. One of the things that I love about this story is that it shows us that the Bible makes room for our humanity. Because Martha finds herself in a moment of deep pain due to unexpected loss. And in the midst of unexpected loss, what we see Martha doing is having to hold multiple things in tension. Number one, she's holding her deep sadness from loss. But also, she's holding the perplexity that comes from knowing that Jesus could have done something and yet he didn't. And at the same time, while she's holding sadness and perplexity, we also see her holding confidence that God is ultimately still going to do what he's intended to do, which is raise Lazarus from the dead on the last day, at the end of time. And the reason that I love this is that it shows Martha's humanity and Jesus doesn't rebuke her for any of it. Like even as she holds the perplexity that Jesus could have done something but didn't. Jesus makes space for it. And some of you, maybe that's why God brought you here this morning, is just so that you could hear that. That he isn't surprised in their space for that in Christ. And yet, what I see happen and what we're going to see happen is that right in the midst of her crisis, Jesus is gonna prompt her to answer a question. He is going to ask her to really decide what she believes to be true about him. And that's often how it works. Like I remember going to one of my close friend's funeral. And as we were mourning the loss of this friend, what I saw was all these different guys from my fraternity in college being brought to this moment where they were really contemplating the deeper things of God. They were deciding what they believed to be true about him because often crisis prompts us to really declare and decide what we believe to be true. And so Jesus makes this declaration about himself and then asks her a question. Look at what he says, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Here's the question Do you believe this? 
That's his question to Martha. He declares to Martha, hey, you need to know I'm the resurrection and the life. Here's what that means. Do you believe this? And the question that Jesus was asking to Martha is the question I believe that he's asking to every single one of us today. The question to you today is, do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? There's a lot of questions that you're going to have to answer in your life. This is the most important one. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life? Some of you hear that and you're like, of course. That's why I'm here today. That's the reason that I got all of my steps in already just to get into this place because I believe that he's the resurrection and the life. Others of you are here because you're just trying to be a good team player and I applaud you for that. But you might hear that the question to you today is, do you believe Jesus is the resurrection and the life? And and you might think, I have no clue what that even means. Well, you know what the great news is? Jesus explains it. He tells us exactly what he means when he says that he's the resurrection and the life. Think about what he's saying. He's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say, I offer resurrection and life. He doesn't say, I can provide resurrection in life or I perform it. He says, I am it. See, Jesus Christ, resurrection is something Jesus has done, is doing, and will do. It is so central to his his activity that it has become central to his identity. Resurrection is who Jesus is. That's why when you look in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, we get this picture from the author John. He's having a vision and he sees a vision of Jesus. And in that vision, Jesus is represented as a lamb. And it says this in Revelation 5, 6, it says, and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. So Jesus the lamb had been slain. What, why, does it, why, is it, why is the lamb portrayed like that? Because Jesus Christ came to earth and lived perfectly, but then he went to the cross and his body was broken and his blood was shed for your sin and for mine. And yet the lamb that was slain was standing. Why? Because the king is alive. Because on the third day, Jesus Christ walked out of the tomb, conquering Satan, sin, and death. See, resurrection is who Jesus is. He always will be the resurrected king. But Jesus isn't just the resurrected king. Watch this. He is the resurrecting king. What I mean by that is that Jesus Christ is in the business of bringing life where there is death. That's why he goes on and explains exactly what he means when he says that he's the resurrection and the life. He says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. What he's saying is, if you know Jesus Christ, a day is coming where you are going to beat death. Death will never have the final word in your life. Cancer will never have the final word. A disease will never have the final word. A disability, a tragic accident, chronic pain, old age, none of these things will ever have the final word in your life because Christ is going to come again. And these physical bodies, if you're in Christ, will be resurrected and perfected. And we will get to enjoy un hindered, abundant life with God in heaven for all of eternity. Isn't that good news? And so just think about it. When Jesus says what he says, you know what he's really saying? He's saying, guys, listen up. I am your hope for life one day. I am your hope for life one day. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on and says, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall shall never die. You know what he's saying? He's saying, hey, that resurrection life that we just talked about, that we're going to experience one day, what Jesus is saying is you don't actually have to wait until you die to experience it. Because eternal life, resurrection life, isn't something that begins the day you die. It's actually something that begins the day you believe. So what I'm really saying is that we get to taste heaven now. Like we don't get to taste all of it now, but we get to at least taste it. We get to enjoy 
in intimate connection with the God of the universe. We get to experience God leading us, caring for us, comforting us, providing for us, and in changing us. We don't have to look dead when we've been made alive because Jesus Christ, who has conquered the grave, his resurrection power is what we need to truly look alive. So Jesus isn't just saying that he is our hope for one day. He is saying that he is our power for life today. And I think it's really important to just acknowledge that Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say, I am a source of resurrection in life. He doesn't say, I'm one of many options. He says, I'm it. Like if you're going to have hope for life one day, if you're going to have power for life today, it's going to have everything to do with me. Now, if you're tuned, in, if you're tuned out, welcome back. Because here's what I want to show you. The reason that I love the story of Lazarus so much is that Jesus... He unpacks this the theological truth that he's the resurrection and the life. But then he's going to give us a physical display of the spiritual reality that he just unpacked. So you need to see how the story plays out. I love this. Here's, here's what happens in verse 38. It says, then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave. And a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. For he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father... I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Now, uh, when I'm reading the Bible and I come to a story like this, I always like to try and put myself in the story just to experience it more. So let's just do that together today. So just imagine we're in Bethany, all three to 4,000 of us, and Jesus just starts walking, so we're going with him. We're all quiet. It's super awkward and uncomfortable. We're in the midst of death here, and so we follow Jesus. And now, we've come to the tomb, which was just a hole that was cut in a rock, but the tomb has been sealed. There's been a stone that's been put in front of that opening. So here we are, three to 4,000 people, all standing there silently and awkwardly looking at a big rock. You there with me? And this is just amazing because Jesus suggests something highly inappropriate. He's like, uh, hey guys, uh, let's open up the tomb. That'd be like going to a closed casket funeral and being like, you know what, we'll take this thing to the next level. Let's crack that bad boy open. <laughs> and Martha's like, hey, Jesus, I, I don't know if you know how death works, but there will be a funk in the air. And Jesus is like, yeah, sounds great. Open her up. So they open up the tomb. Now we are looking into a hole in a rock and all we see is a lifeless Lazarus. There is a body that is bound up in dead man's cloth and we are all silently, awkwardly staring at a dead man. And Jesus gets more awkward because he starts talking to the dead guy. But this is where it gets really interesting. Because when Jesus says his name, Lazarus, his voice is like a defibrillator to Lazarus' soul. Lazarus. And the chest rises with air. Can you see it? Can you see the chest just filling up? Now, hey, that's amazing, but I'm just going to say it. In my experience with that possum, it is weird when something that is supposed to be dead starts moving again. 
So I guarantee you there were grown men whose feet left the ground when that oxygen filled that chest. Lazarus, oh, hey, that is messed up. They're like stepping behind their wife like, that is messed up, you gotta be kidding me. And then the story is clear that Lazarus' hands are bound, his feet are bound, his face is wrapped. And so Jesus says, come out. And now this dead man is shuffling out of the tomb. And my favorite part of the story is the fact that Lazarus comes out and Jesus looks at the people standing around and is like, unbind him. If I were there, I'd be like, you heard him unbind him. I mean, you're closer with Lazarus than I am, man. Get after it. And people come around Lazarus and they unwrap him of the cloth that signified death. Now remember, this is a physical demonstration of the spiritual reality that Jesus unpacked. Jesus says he's the resurrection and the life. And then what does he say? He says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He's declaring, I am your hope for life one day. Just as Lazarus was dead and came to life and was unwrapped of the cloth that signified death, a day is coming where even though you die, Jesus Christ is going to resurrect you and your life is going to be unwrapped of death itself, which is amazing news. So just think about this, okay? On this side of eternity, every single one of us is going to die. Like every single one of us is going to have to say bye for now to the people that you love. Like that's just a reality. Every single one of us is trapped in a body that is on the clock. And your clock might have more time than mine, but every single one of us is going to have to say bye for now to loved ones. And you're going to have loved ones have to say bye for now to you. And yet, let's be clear, because Jesus Christ has conquered death, so shall we. So on the other side of eternity, what we will get to say bye forever to is everything that took us to Jesus in the first place. So on this side of eternity, it's bye for now. On the other side of the eternity, it's bye forever to cancer. It's bye forever to disease. It's bye forever to disability and chronic pain and tragic accidents in old age. It is bye forever because Jesus Christ conquered death through his resurrection. I love what Scholar D.A. Carson says, he says, I am not suffering from anything a good resurrection can't fix. Some of y'all desperately need to hear that today because you're in a place in life where you are having to hold in tension just the deep sadness of the loss of a loved one alongside the perplexity of knowing Jesus could do something and yet he didn't. And you're having to hold that intention and I can't imagine the heartache and the heartbreak that you're experiencing. And yet if you're in Christ, you're someone who grieves with hope because it was a buy for now, but it's not a buy forever. And that person who you lost in Christ has already gotten to say buy forever to the thing that took them to Jesus in the first place. And that's great news. But then remember, Jesus says, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. What's he saying here? He's saying, I'm not just your hope for life one day. I am your power for life today. Meaning eternal life doesn't begin the day you die. It begins the day you believe. So Lazarus was raised from the dead and he's unwrapped of the cloth that signifies death. In the same way, we can begin the unwrapping process now. In fact, the normal Christian life is just a life where you're committed to being unwrapped a little bit more every single day. The normal Christian life is a life where you look more and more alive and less and less dead each day. I want to invite my son Noah onto the stage just to help me uh, help me illustrate this. Will you guys just say hello to Noah? 
Uh, Noah's in eighth grade at North. He's 14. This is every 14-year-old's dream to be forced onto the stage by their dad in front of three to 4,000 people. If you'll just hold this, I'm just going to... I'll be right back with y'all in just a moment. I'm getting so dizzy. Looking good, man. Here's what I want you to think about, okay? Imagine that Lazarus shuffled out of the tomb. (laughs) Hold still. (laughs) Imagine Lazarus shuffled out of the tomb and never bothered getting unwrapped. Like he just kept on shuffling. Imagine going to the grocery store and looking down the frozen food aisle and it's like, there's the dead guy. Imagine if this was Noah's reality, like he shows up to North Junior High tomorrow like this. Like, I think on the first day, his friends would be like, bold move, man, I respect that. And then by Friday, they'd be like, bro, what are we doing here? Like, is this what's happening? Just imagine the life he would miss out on. Like, imagine Noah going on a date a long time from now. And, and this is his reality. Like, imagine being the girl sitting across the table from this. Like, dude, did you choose that? Like, did, what, what's happening here? Like, just imagine the life that he would miss out on. Now, you might be like, this is such a ridiculous illustration. You know what's... <laughs> Imagine how ridiculous it is that Christ has conquered the grave and he has made us alive. And yet so many of us just keep shuffling through life, wrapped up in the dead man's cloth that Christ came to free us from. So think about it. Some of us are are so wrapped up in anger, bitterness, and resentment towards someone who has hurt us. Others of us are are wrapped up in jealousy and envy. We just wish that we were a little bit more like the people down the hall in the office down the hall or in the house down the street in our neighborhood. Others of us are wrapped up in in lust. Still others of us are wrapped up in in people-pleasing in just a desperate need for certain people's approval. And then for others of us, we're wrapped up in idolatry. We believe that the greatest satisfaction to our souls is just more of something, more more money, more square footage in our home, more cars, more luxury to our vacations. But Jesus' resurrection is for our resurrection. He beat death for you and for me. He is in the business of bringing life where there is death. So just imagine Jesus allowing him to begin to unwrap us. And because of his resurrection, like instead of anger, bitterness, and resentment, there's the freedom of forgiveness. Why? Because you've experienced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Instead of being wrapped up in in people pleasing and in need for people's approval, there's, there's the freedom of already being pleasing and accepted by the God of the universe. Why? Because Christ's righteousness has been given to you through his death, burial, and resurrection. Instead of being wrapped up in jealousy and envy, there's the freedom of celebration that you can celebrate God's grace in the lives of your brothers and sisters in Christ while they can celebrate God's grace in your life as well. Instead of being wrapped up in 
in lust, there's the freedom of selfless and sacrificial love. See, lust, lust steals, it takes. Sacrificial love, it gives and it blesses. Instead of being wrapped up in, in idolatry, there's just the freedom, there's the freedom of enjoying the one that your soul has been made for, that Christ has come and he has given you access to boldly approach his throne. And so we get to know him and be satisfied in him because we have been made for him. Would you guys thank Noah for helping me out today? See, Jesus conquered sin and death so that we could live, not just one day, but today. So let me just ask you to evaluate, in what areas of your life do you still look dead? If something comes to mind, here's, here's what you need to hear. It's time to be unwrapped. And then what I want to make sure of is this. If you're here this morning and you, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are just being a good team player this morning, I'm so glad that you're here today. But what I want you to hear is that you will feel no need you will not care about hope or power in Jesus until you realize that there is only death apart from Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? Like hope and power in Jesus, it will not be meaningful to you. What we are talking about today will not be meaningful to you until you realize that there is only death apart from Jesus. The reason that I love this story about Lazarus is that it shows us everything that is possible when we know Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Just think about where things uh, begin at the tomb. It begins with Lazarus in the tomb and the tomb is sealed shut, meaning Lazarus' fate is final. In Judaism, there was this belief that the soul would hover around the body for three days, hoping to re-enter. But if the soul didn't re-enter the body, it was done. How many days had Lazarus been in the tomb? Four, which means no one was standing around thinking, you know what, if I know Lazarus, he's gonna bounce back from this thing. Like he is a fighter, just watch, he's my boy. And he's coming back from this thing. No, his fate, his fate was final. And what we all have to understand is if this book is correct, then that is a physical display of our spiritual reality. If we don't know Jesus Christ, we are physically alive, but we are spiritually dead, just like a lifeless body incapable of doing anything. We, in the eyes of God, are incapable of doing anything that would be enough to earn his reward of heaven. We cannot love him enough and we cannot live for him enough for him to look at us and give us heaven as a reward. It just means that we are not spiritually bad people who need to start being good. We are not spiritually weak people who need to start working out by going to church or trying harder. We are spiritually dead people. And yet what happens when Jesus comes along? When Jesus intersects with Lazarus, what happens? He calls him by name and he awakens him to life. Lazarus comes out, oxygen fills his soul. And what do you see Lazarus doing in the very next chapter? You see him sitting at the dinner table, enjoying life with Jesus. See, what you need to know is that's what Jesus does for us. We are dead spiritually until Jesus comes along and he calls us by name. And when you put your faith in Jesus, when you surrender your life to Jesus, just as oxygen filled Lazarus's soul, the spirit of God fills you and you are alive with God. And Jesus Christ has come. He has lived perfectly. He has died a sufficient death and he has risen from the grave victorious to bring us into a real enjoyable relationship with God. His resurrection is for our resurrection. You know what I love is commentators talk about the fact that Jesus's word was so powerful that it was very important that he specified Lazarus. Because if he hadn't specified Lazarus, all of the graves would have just started giving up their dead. Can you imagine? Come 
out. My bad, my bad. Just Lazarus today, folks. Like, I'm going to come back for the rest of you, but today I just need Lazarus. What's the point? The point is that Jesus Christ is powerful enough to raise anyone to new life with him. No one is too far gone. There is no one here that cannot experience complete forgiveness of sins. There's nothing that you could come forward and say, yeah, but you don't know that I did this or I went there or I was with so-and-so. Nothing. No one is too far gone. No one is beyond the bounds of the saving power of Jesus Christ. Forgiveness of sins is available to every person this morning. But I'll tell you where it starts. It starts with you answering the question that Jesus asked to Martha. What did Jesus say? He looked at her and said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Not do you believe that it would be a nice thing to start coming to church more. Not do you believe that it's important to just start living better. Do you believe this? That if you're going to have hope for life one day, it's going to have everything to do with Jesus. And if you're going to have power for life today, it's going to have everything to do with Jesus. What was Martha's response? You are the Christ. Do you believe this? That Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Let's pray together. And if you're one of those people that walked into this place without a relationship with Jesus and yet right now you want to respond, you even sense that Jesus is calling your name, inviting you to come into a relationship with him, then I want to invite you right now to give your life to Jesus. I'd invite you to just pray these words. You can just say, Lord Jesus, would you come into my life today? I give my life to you. I realize I am incapable of earning heaven as a reward. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for me. Thank you that you rose from the dead for me. Would you forgive me of all of my sins? Would you lead me in a new life as, as my king? And if you're here this morning and you know Jesus, in a personal way. Let me just ask you, in what areas of your life do you still look dead? Whatever it is, just invite Jesus into that space right now. Lord Jesus, we celebrate you as the resurrection and the life, the one in whom is our hope for life one day and the one in whom is our power for life today. We need you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.